Hi, I'd just again like to thank the board for allowing me to present this evening. For everyone else who's in attendance, my name is Ryan Samberg. And I'm here to begin a discussion on what I believe are positive changes to our school, current school discipline policy we have here at Salem. And more specifically, I'm looking to kind of end the zero tolerance policy. I'm looking at a new way how we can discipline our students at school. So before we kind of get into those changes, we first need to understand what a zero tolerance is and what it exactly entails. So the zero tolerance policy assigns explicit predetermined punishments to specific violations of school rules regardless of the situation or context of the behavior. In many cases, punishment for a violation under the policy is severe, such as suspension or expulsion from school. And again, we'll look at some of these cases as we continue to go through this. In theory, zero tolerance deters students from violent or illegal behavior because the punishment for such a violation is harsh and guaranteed. The current policy we have at Salem states, the zero tolerance policy for weapons, dangerous objects, and violence will be aggressively enforced. Any student who is involved in a fight in possession of a weapon, a dangerous weapon, is subject to arrest and may face criminal proceedings. Each student will follow these simple rules or risk being expelled. The following rules are part of the zero tolerance policy we hold at Salem. Uh, so the current policy states for the first part is number one, acts or threats of violence including fights will result in suspension and or possible expulsion. Any student who engages in any violent act will be given five days of suspension for the first offense and may be recommended for expulsion for the first incident depending on the degree and severity of the incident. All second offenses will result in a recommendation for expulsion. Two, any student who participates in an incident that threatens the safety of others will also be recommended for expulsion. And the third point, possession of any weapon or dangerous object will automatically result in suspension and recommendation for expulsion. So why change the policy? And we're going to just kind of touch on these points and then I'm going to go into more depth as we kind of continue on. So the first reason is zero tolerance policies tend to ignore a couple constitutional rights. Number two, the lack of flexibility of zero tolerance policies prohibits administrators from taking that child's age, past history, or the severity of the offense into account. And thirdly, research has proven zero tolerance policies are ineffective and have high rates of racial disparity. So what constitutional rights do zero tolerance policies ignore? Well, the first one is zero tolerance policies tend to ignore constitutionally protected rights of students because these policies tend to operate under the automatic presumption of guilt. Under zero tolerance policies, the student's past record of behaviors is not considered, as well as the seriousness of offense. If the presumption of guilt is automatic, students are denied the opportunity to explain their side of the story, and as a result, their right to due process was violated. A hearing which we see common when there's a kid that might be suspended for drugs and faces a possible expulsion, where an outcome is predetermined doesn't satisfy due process because again we've already said he did these drugs or he had brought these drugs to school, here's the punishment which is expulsion. Um, in another instance, in this case, in the Supreme Court case, Redding v. Safford Unified School District, um, this person's Fourth Amendment right was violated. So in 2009, Sabati Redding an 8th grader at Safford Middle School was strip searched by school officials on the basis of a tip by another student that Miss Ruddy might have ibuprofen in her possession, which is a violation of school policy. Miss Ruddy subsequently filed suit against the school district and the school officials responsible for the search. She alleged her Fourth Amendment right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure was violated. The district court granted the defendant's motion for summary judgment and dismissed the case. On initial appeal, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Court affirmed. However, on rehearing before the entire court, the Court of Appeals held that Mrs. Redding's Fourth Amendment right to be free of an unreasonable search and seizure was violated. It reasoned that the strip search was not justified, nor was the scope of intrusion reasonably related to the circumstance. 
how do we know, and again, in other cases, how do we know zero tolerance policies are inflexible and don't allow administrators to use their general judgment? Well, these are all cases that have actually happened within the last six or seven years. Again, these are just a few of them, and as we kind of go through them, you'll see how um, inflexible they really are. So, for the first example, a fifth grade student drew up a bloody vampire for his art class assignment. He was told that he could not return to school because that he, unless he passed a psychological test. In this instance, in the second case, an 11-year-old honor student was suspended for six days because they brought a toddler-proof butter knife to school to cut a peach during lunch. Thirdly, a ninth grader in Maine was suspended for being in possession of Tylenol, which violated the zero tolerance and anti-drug policies. And in fourth instance, in New York, a 12-year-old girl was handcuffed and arrested for writing on a desk in green marker, I love my friends, Abby and Faith, Lex was here, 2110, with a smiley face at the end. Again, you can obviously see based on these four incidents, they're pretty harmless incidents, and if administrators were allowed to use their um, judgment in most of these cases, they probably the punishment necessarily didn't really fit the crime in these cases. So are zero tolerance policies effective? The American Psychological Association, after 10 years of research, found no evidence that increasing suspensions and expulsions improve student behavior or guarantees school safety. In fact, they continue to find out that, more, that schools that hand out more suspension and expulsions have higher ratings of climate and school safety, higher rates of racial disparity with black and Latino students being suspended and expelled at much higher rates than white students and also results in lower academic scores on achievement tests. And this was an actual graph of suspension rates by race and ethnicity in 2013 and 2014. It was done by the Wisconsin Council of Children and Families, so they looked at all their suspensions and expulsion rates in Wisconsin. And as you can see, based on this graph, it's pretty apparent that there is some racial disparity being seen. In fact, black or African American students were suspended um, seven at seven, a rate of 17 percent, compared to American or white students who were suspended at a rate of two percent. That's about an eight times differential. To give you an idea how different that is, the national average is usually black. Blacks suspended at a four to one rate, and in this case in Wisconsin, based on the 2013-2014 data, they're just expelled almost at an eight times the rate of a white student. And again, you can see, which is kind of similar to the facts that were found on the previous slide, Latinos are expelled at a 4% rate, which again is higher than their white counterparts and peers. Um, again, are they policies effective? Um, according to the Council of State Governments, being suspended or expelled significantly increases the risk of school dropout in contact with the juvenile justice system. These risks are magnified for students of color. And then a lot of, in a lot of these suspension or expulsion cases, often the students are report, repeat offenders, suggesting that the at-risk students are not getting the message of deterrence from these zero tolerance policies that we have set in place in these schools. So what are the alternatives we could have at Salem to a zero, zero tolerance policy? Well, for one, we could begin emphasizing strategies that build a positive school climate and minimize the use of school suspension and expulsion unless it's absolutely necessary. Second point, we can continue to build upon our PBIS program at Salem and develop more school-wide proactive strategies to encourage positive social behaviors rather than only focusing on punishing negative behaviors. Um, give more class time to teaching students the behavioral expectations at school and how to recognize and manage their emotions. Again, this could be done with maybe the guidance counselor coming in weekly or bi-weekly to talk about these issues with the students. Um, have a strong emphasis on school climate that fosters social and academic growth and a sense of community. More alternatives include implementing a program at Salem where we begin targeting the at-risk kids and provide behavioral supports for them, such as weekly activities, to build social skills, such as listening skills, anger management skills, and conflict resolution. 
with individualized behavior to support. If possible, we could even involve trusted family members to help with this. And we could have implement a better system for collecting and using data to make decisions regarding school-wide behavior. Maybe looking to see where these, making sure to see where these information is actually happening and where these incidents are happening. What would the new policy cost? Monetarily, very little. Maybe, for example, for the program implementing or finding the system of actually looking at the school data with regards to discipline. But teachers, really what's going to be needed, teachers would need time and training to understand the new policies, as well as to build upon our PBS program at school and develop more school-wide proactive strategies to encourage positive social behaviors. What might the new policy look like? Uh, we'll recognize students possess constitutional rights. Um, use the language in the student handbook and policy which includes applying discipline policies with greater flexibility that takes school context and teacher administrator expertise into account. So these ex examples that we talked about earlier with the student being suspended with having bringing Tylenol in um, wouldn't necessarily occur. And also have language that shows graduated systems of discipline where consequences are geared to the seriousness of the infraction. So this would be a potential weapons revision policy I made for Salem. So this is just on weapons, and we'll get into the fighting policy point later. Um, for weapons, Salem School District shall strive to provide a safe and healthy environment for all, for all persons on its premises or attending any of its activities or functions. To aid in reaching this goal, the district will strictly enforce policy that no one shall possess, use, or store a dangerous weapon on school property, school buses, or at any school event. Furthermore, no student will use a dangerous weapon to threaten the life of another student, an employee, or any other person while on school property, or engage in a school activity, or on or off school property. Dangerous weapons and look-alike weapons are prohibited. And then a dangerous weapon is classified as a firearm loaded or unloaded, chains, or any other device or instrument which in the manner it is used or intended to be used is calculated or likely to produce ways of great bodily harm. A weapons violation would be categorized in one or three ways. So category one would be possession of a dangerous weapon. Uh, the penalty could be determined, again, by the discretion of the administrator and school board with the possibility of suspension and expulsion. Again, this gives potential in all three of these different categories, you're going to see leeway and it's going to be based on the discretion of the administration and the school board, which I think is an important aspect to have. Category two, uh, possession of a weapon while threatened to cause bodily harm. And the penalty, again, could be determined at the discretion of the administrator and the school board with the possibility of suspension and expulsion. And then category three, possession and use of a weapon that causes bodily harm. And the penalty, again, could be possible suspension or expulsion as determined by the administration and school board. Um, for the fighting, the provision policy for fighting, again, it would give, again, more leeway to administrators and teachers to help make these decisions. A student shall not intentionally cause or attempt to cause physical injury or unintentional behavior in such a way as could reasonably cause physical injury to any person. Any student involved in fighting or promoting fighting shall be subject to disciplinary action at the discretion of the administrators up to possible dismissal from campus. Again, the current one we have in place was after the first, there was, they were automatically suspended for the first um, fight and the second policy they were recommended for expulsion if they were found fighting. Again, it allows for more discretion on the administrators and to look into these incidents. So what would be the timeline implementation if we enacted this plan or we got rid of the zero tolerance policy? Well, since it's in July right now, if we, uh, the goal would be to implement at the beginning of the 2018-29 school year. And so this would give us a year to involve teachers, parents, and community leaders and student representatives in the formulation of discipline policies. Again, the one I just made up were just revisions where I could see, but I think it would be important to have teachers, parents, and community leaders involved. Make, makes them feel like they're more a part of the school and they're a member of the school. Um, additionally, it provides time for appropriate professional development for teachers and administrators to develop more school-wide 
proactive strategies to encourage positive social behaviors. Thirdly, we, so it gets us time to inform parents, the community of changes to the school discipline plan at school. Again, if we actually decide to implement this type of policy, we could go to the we could have a school board where the, the principal or administrator could actually present these policies to the community and the and the and the parents. They kind of know what's going on within the school. And then finally, obviously, we need to update these policies in the student. All right. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for allowing me again for allowing me to present. If you have any questions afterwards, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.